point beggars can't be choosers, I would advocate for anything that gives the Taiwanese military real combat experience to help them see that their sort of sclerotic vision of centralized war from on high is just not going to succeed against anything the Chinese throw at them. This is the solution. We invade Taiwan. <laughs> well, I, as, I, as in the United States? Yes. Or is this podcast? Okay. The United, no, we don't have a military, Shelly, obviously. Don't let them know we have a military. <laughs> no, the United States invades, and then they have to get the experience fighting the U.S. No one would see it coming. <laughs> there, there, there may be uh, some militias here in the home state of Texas that might be willing to join up for that little... Uh, Texas uh, alone invades Taiwan. Easy. So, now we talk about this a lot on the show, but I think it always bears repeating in, in the context of everything we've talked about before. What is at stake? What are the consequences for Taiwan, for the United States, for the world, if China is successful? Where do I get my semiconductors? <laughs> so, the stakes, I think, are significant. The United States has very important interests in Taiwan, I guess I would quibble with some who say we have unlimited interests, and in other words, it's worth kind of everything we could possibly do to defend Taiwan, which is why I think it is important to signal to Taiwan, you are important, but you're not everything. We wouldn't want to survive without you, but we could if we had to, which means it really is incumbent on you to do everything you can to defend yourself. Uh, so you make the good case to the American people that this is a fight worth fighting, and it's a fight that's actually possible to win. But I think there are a few key pieces. The first is, I mean, it's, a democracy. It is not a democracy by accident, but it is a democracy that self-democratized despite the fact that we threw it under the bus. And I don't even want to begin to imagine the ramifications. We are already in a moment in history where democracy is on its heels. And if the United States were to simply allow Taiwan to be absorbed coercively by China, thereby extinguishing a very important example of Sinic democracy, I think that would reverberate quite loudly. Yes, there are economic implications. I don't want to hang too much importance on the economic side because I think economies can adapt. It would be very costly to do so. I also worry a bit about going too far down the semiconductor argument because I think in a crisis situation, the semiconductor becomes a hostage. And if the semiconductor industry is a hostage, it really then turns on a balance of resolve. And if I were to assess American willingness to go without Taiwanese semiconductors, against Chinese willingness to go without semiconductors, I think I know which side is going to blink first. And so I would hate to allow Beijing to put us in a position where it's holding a gun to the semiconductor industry's head and saying, go ahead, uh, I'll pull the trigger because Beijing might do it and we might be the ones to say, you know what, we're going to back down. I think another key piece of this is the potential for reputational trickle-down effects or knockdown effects. And by that, I mean... Japan and South Korea and Australia and to a lesser degree Europe are going to be watching what we do and what we don't do in a Taiwan Strait crisis very closely. Now, I don't want to go so far as to say if we were to abandon Taiwan in a moment of crisis, that that is the end of the liberal international order. I don't think it's quite that simple. But I definitely think there are missteps and mistakes the United States could make, especially with loose talk in the earliest stages of a crisis. And whatever decision that we make, People are going to be watching around the world, and they're going to infer from that something about our willingness uh, to intervene or to not intervene on their behalf. But the most important consequence is, if a war happens in the Taiwan Strait because we were unsuccessful at deterring China, and we have to fight, we simply have to understand that there is a risk, number one, that we win, but we win a Pyrrhic victory, or number two, that we lose. Which is why I like to keep coming back and saying deterrence is worth literally any price, because every other possible outcome short of Xi Jinping just immediately being raptured and this whole problem going away is decidedly worse off for the U.S. and for Taiwan. You think he's going to go up, not down? Uh, as a non-religious man, I am not willing to place a bet on where he goes. Uh, if you were to go somewhere, uh, well, even there, it might be wishful thinking that the whole Taiwan trade problem goes along with him. Mm. Well, that is a good question. It, the, the CCP is, at the end of the day, the fundamental problem. And China right now is beset by some pretty unprecedented economic and political challenges. Is is there a possibility that it'll just resolve itself? I think that that, I, I would say more likely than not that war doesn't happen. I don't think that war is an inevitability. I don't even know that I'd say, you know, it's 51% likely. What concerns me is that, of course, way more likely than I would be comfortable with, both as a veteran, as somebody who's married to an active duty service member and who 
someone who just cares about uh, global stability. And so in my mind, again, the idea is let's just do everything we can to enhance Taiwan's defenses. Let's do everything we can to show China that we are actually serious about security and stability in the Indo-Pacific. And then hopefully that combined with the economic and political and cultural headwinds that she faces are just going to convince him, like Pottinger likes to say, you know what, let me just come back and I'll revisit this another day. So always push it off to the next day. Let's let's it's, try to get Xi Jinping to procrastinate for as long as possible. Is that the... Let, let's give him an excuse. Let's give him an yeah. excuse. We should get him addicted to TikTok. <laughs> he, he's just doom scrolling and forgets to launch an invasion. I yeah, he, he his attention span becomes trash. <laughs> can't focus. Uh, we've come up with great ideas. This, Invade. America invades... God, no one would expect that. <laughs> and then the semiconductors would be ours. The real problem is we haven't figured out a way to profit from those wonderful ideas. And that's why you should never be interviewing professors. We're just really bad at that. Oh, yeah, that's, that's a good one. I mean, profit, war for oil, we war for semiconductors. That's true. Uh, so uh, for people watching oh. this um, program around the world, and they're, you know, obviously some of them are going to be worried about an invasion and all the consequences of that. Uh, what is it that that ordinary people can do? Should we mail Taiwanese citizens guns? I I feel like there are so many ways that could probably go sideways on us if we were to try that attempt. Um, I would say first and foremost is just paying attention to the problem set and being an informed voter or citizen because it has probably become easy to sort of just tune this stuff out, the, you know, Taiwan, most dangerous place in the world headlines. Maybe those were shocking a few years ago, but at a certain point that can lull even Western voters into a false sense of complacency. I would say for those who are really interested in the issue, certainly studying up on it, but also reaching out to representatives on the Hill would be useful because one of the challenges I have heard from talking to those who do work on these issues on the Washington side of things is that there's this sense, you know, I said, or I try to make the case we need to be willing to twist some arms. Yes, they are our friends, but good friends tell each other unpalatable truths, like you got something between your teeth. And in this case, Taiwan has something really big between their teeth. Uh, there is a reluctance, I think, on the Hill and in this administration right now to really play hardball with our friends and partners. And I get it that more often than not, you, you don't want to do that sort of thing. But I think that the stakes are sufficient and the threat is realistic enough that this is a time for sort of unprecedented action. And so to the degree that those watching are willing to reach out the next time they have a conversation, send an email to one of the representatives or senators saying, you know, this is something I take seriously. It would have serious ramifications for the American people if she were to go ahead and gamble on war. It is in our interest for you to have those tough conversations. So the next time a congressional delegation goes to Taiwan, they're not just there to eat the bouts and everything else, uh, but rather to ask some really hard questions and maybe behind closed doors uh, to make it clear what our expectations are and that we're going to be paying close attention. What about Taiwanese people? What can they do outside of the government stepping up? Yeah, so I would say there are two big things. The bigger ask is for people to join the civil defense grassroots organizations, and there are a lot of them out there right now, Polar North, Hume Academy, uh, and Ford Alliance by Inaku. Each of these organizations has a slightly different approach to the problem set. In my mind, let's not let perfect be the enemy of good. Getting more Taiwanese to sign up for these training courses will mentally prepare them, but it's also going to send a signal to Beijing and to Washington that the Taiwanese people are serious, even if their government hasn't yet caught up. The easier ask, because obviously joining a civil defense organization that's time and you know expense, would be to take steps at home to prepare yourself for a worst case scenario. And I have heard there have been some U.S. government folks in Taiwan who have said things like prepare like you would for a natural disaster, a typhoon or an earthquake. And I don't think that's great advice because, number one, a typhoon or earthquake is a short duration event, maybe a couple of minutes, a couple of hours, a couple of days. And number two, generally speaking, these natural disasters only hit one part of Taiwan at a time. And I think what we really need to do is to push people to think about what would you do if there were a full scale invasion? And the central government becomes necessarily fixated on mobilizing the military and making sure it's ready to fight. And how are you going to get water? 
How are you going to get food? Because none of these things may be getting through for a prolonged period of time, and you won't be able to turn to the government for that support. So mentally preparing and literally doing a little bit of reasonable stockpiling, they don't have to become full-on preppers, maybe just light preppers, I think would, would definitely go a long way to, to helping out. And the final piece is, of course, for the Taiwanese people who take this seriously to push their political leaders to, to make this a serious effort. 